My name is Dr Cameron Hill and I'm a postdoctoral research associate at King's College London in the lab of Malcolm Irving and I am the corresponding author for editorial published in Aging entitled Is a Beta Serious Factor for Sleep Muscle Aging which is what the sort of topic of this conversation between myself and Paul will be about. So I'm using X-ray diffraction techniques to understand how sleep muscles are regulated in terms of their muscle contractions so um, this can have nice applications there down the line to factors such as obesity and aging. My name's uh, Dr Paul Morgan. I currently work at the University of Birmingham in, in the UK uh, under the direction, I guess, of, of Dr Lee Breen. I should start by saying that my PhD was in neuromuscular function and performance. So so how I got here was, was a PhD with Professor Andy Jones. Very different from the discussions that me and Cam are going to have today. But currently my main focus is is looking at the more of the direct role of obesity in vivo on muscle function uh, as we age. So a lot of crossover between what, what Cam said there and I'll touch on it as we go throughout today's discussion, but we're using a number of different techniques, microscopy to look at lipid droplets and uh, and a number of other different techniques that I say that we'll discuss as we progress to, to further tease out some of the mechanisms that might be contributing to either improved or impaired muscle function in aging with obesity. Yeah, just to provide a bit of context, my background is in skin muscle aging and obesity at the articulated muscle level. So for my PhD, I did that at Coventry University under the supervision of Dr. Jason Tallis, who is also the co-author of the editorial in aging. I used an isolated muscle approach to understand how factors such as aging and obesity in aging can affect the concentric and eccentric contractile properties of isolated skeletal muscles, so um, salaris and EDL um, in terms of locomotor performance and the diaphragm to understand how respiratory function is affected as well. Right. I think um, probably the best best uh, way to start is I just wrote down the, the brief bit that we had discussed before mm. and I should say that this discussion obviously came off the back of your editorial and, and yeah. some brief and that was obviously a brief editorial but and, and discussions around that so I was going to suggest start and discuss if I just give a brief outline of the paper and then we can talk about the caveats of that great yeah yeah over to you yeah Sounds okay. So, in mine and Dr. Tallis's editorial in aging, we explore how obesity in old age affects skeletal muscle function in in humans. So, how does obesity, as you get older and fatter, how does that affect skeletal muscle contractile performance and the morphological aspects of things, and how that may um, impact on biomechanical function, activity of daily living, and overall quality of life. However, we argue that such an approach is difficult to capture on the aspect in terms of uh, direct skeletal muscle applications. So we argue that an isolated muscle approach where we exercise a muscle from a living organism and e examine its um, contractile properties is a better approach to understanding the muscle-specific nature of obesity, which leads to a paper which I published in Nutrients alongside Dr. Asian Talis and my other co-authors, um, exploring whether obesity in old age affects isolated skeletal muscle contractile function. So yeah. Right, so um, I, well, I guess for those listening, the first thing to note is that I think we just, we agree on a lot anyway, um, mm. but hopefully there'll be some things that we perhaps not necessarily distinctly disagree on, but we can discuss in a little bit more yeah. detail, uh, a little bit of disagreement here and there. And I think perhaps the biggest disagreement, although perhaps we won't start off by that conversation, is, is the strengths and negatives of your approach versus our approach in terms of the whole body in vivo and then, you know, the stuff that you do in the mouse models with isolated muscle approaches. And, and I've got a couple of points that we'll, we can discuss as, like, say, as we progress. But I think the first point I wanted to mention was how we got there in the first place in regard to lem fairly lengthy Twitter conversation. And that was, is there sufficient evidence to suggest that, or to support that obesity per se increases muscle mass and cross-sectional area? That was my um, first question to you. And then it sort of led on to the next point of, would you expect a completely sedentary obese individual to maintain high levels of muscle mass? Because I guess as we both know, it seems to be that in the literature there's some some support that obesity may be or a certain level of obesity may be protective in older age so i think that's a really interesting question in first is there sufficient evidence to support that actually obesity does have a positive effect on muscle mass and we can talk about the specific effects in, in in a moment but also whether you would expect a completely sedentary individual to maintain higher levels of muscle mass according to the current research which suggests that anyway so, so i don't know if you want to touch on a little bit of that yeah, of course. So based off of our literature research, 
yeah. we tend to find that in younger beasts and older beast adults that muscles that are partially supported so muscles which are loaded and actually are responsible for keeping us upright for example so slayers the lower limbs those are chronically loaded to be able to support a heavier body mass and yes. at which on a contractile level there's evidence to show that absolute force is increased so they're able to actually try and shift this heavier load as a result overall muscle cross-sectional area tends to be increased so there's potential evidence to suggest that this loading effect is actually hypertrophy to actually try and overcome. I hope that I could just quickly butt in there, Cam, as well, because I think there's something that's just come to mind that would be good for discussion on that point, is that for my first question in relation to the hypertrophy, which I, I must say I agree with according to the literature and some of the bits that I've read and so on, but first of all would be would be a question about the quality of the muscle mass. So when we, when we go to the gym and we perform exercises where we see hypertrophy and see strength gains and so on, we see on a lay, te- on a lay level we see good quality mass improvements mm. my first question to that would be what is the quality of that muscle mass that is being ma- better maintained or is increasing or, or whatever however you want to refer to it and my second would be how important is absolute ma- or absolute mass or absolute strength and isn't is relative mass and relative strength not more important in aging yeah so it was a bit of a beast sorry yeah yeah, yeah. so nice no, so it's grand don't worry about it i'm just trying to think of the first question so, so remind me what the first question was again so my first question is maybe oh, pertaining to yes. some of the work that my colleagues have done, um, but also some work, other work by other groups that suggests that although we see this higher amount of muscle mass in the obese group, we, we tend to see higher levels of type 2 muscle fibers mm-hmm. um, as a result. And we know the issues that have with, or that we have with not maintaining type 1 muscle fibers as we age and the importance it has on blood glucose regulation for example and therefore can lead to lead to you know metabolic disease or some sort of metabolic dysregulation yeah i I was just interested in your thoughts on that really yeah so I'll, i'll take it from a muscle quality perspective first so for the lay viewer muscle quality to a muscle physiologist represents how well a muscle performs relative to its size so Normally, this involves normalizing force or power relative to muscle cross-sectional area, which can be derived from computer tomography, for example, or um, MRI as well to get whole muscle size, but that's less common. And what the in vivo literature suggests, what the literature suggests in humans, is that obesity has a negative effect on muscle quality. However, one of the issues is that it's better to understand the muscle quality relative to the whole tissue size, which is incredibly difficult to measure in vivo. Mm-hmm. Another, another aspect which is worth noting is that it's difficult to capture the muscle-specific responses of obesity, so muscles with a specific mechanical role or a, muscle, or a specific phenotype. So what physiologists tend to investigate when measuring obesity in old age is the contractile performance of, say, the knee flexors and knee extensors. So they'll place somebody into a isoclastic anemometer and they'll ask them to exert a load over over a continuous range what the, one of the issues even though it's a good measure of muscle force one of the issues with that is is you can't understand how it affects a specific, specific muscle as that involves multiple muscle groups and another factor is is the normalization so what historically people have tended to do is even normalize the cross-sectional area again not representative of the whole muscle or the muscle or specific muscle yeah yeah or they or they normalize the whole body mass now the issue of normalizing the whole body mass is you could have a a stronger person but they have a huge body mass so it yeah. is disproportionate it's just it's disproportional so with regards to how that might affect overall mechanical performance even though this person may be stronger in absolute terms the actual ability to overcome a greater limb mass because the actual quality of the tissue is poorer um, could have significant impacts for older obese individuals. So they yeah. might find activities such as stair ascent or moving from a stand seating to standing position, for example. So, so all any essential movement. It's actual daily tasks, right? Yeah, any, any yeah, any sort of activity of daily living which may affect the overall quality of life. However, such these factors haven't really been extensively measured in vivo, so they haven't been huge amount of studies which have looked at how obesity in old age affects somebody's ability to perform these tasks of daily living. There, there are some and by and large they suggest that they are poorer however we can't understand what the muscle specific effects of this is so overall there's a, there's a negative impact but how can we therefore treat it if we don't understand how it affects the, the muscle level and um just just before we move on because 
you mentioned obviously the importance of normalization of muscle mass as well and i don't know how how familiar you are with the work of of jamie mcphee and so on at mmu yeah i've actually just published a paper with him in um, oh, sure. experimental yeah, sure. anthology yeah yeah so Jamie's a collaborator on our project at the moment, and he's trying to really push this whole normalising force even further mm. to patella tendon moment arm. Yeah. And I don't know how familiar you are with that. Obviously, you need MRI to measure that, but that's what we're currently doing in our project. So we're measuring the length of the patella tendon moment arm. I think that, I don't know how big of an effect that's going to have, but I think it's important going forward that that is a consideration. You know, if we're looking to properly normalise force, that should also be considered as well. I believe from memory, there is a paper published by Jamie McPhee and yeah. his colleagues at Manchester Met in 2018, looking at sex-specific differences in in age in relation to in situ specific force so in situ yes. specific force is um how force is normalized to muscle size yeah. and there's evidence to suggest that you can actually measure muscle quality in vivo however as i relate back to earlier it's difficult to capture the muscle specific effect especially especially for something like the diaphragm you can measure activity of the diaphragm but you can't measure how well it contracts and you can the way you can do that's via respiratory function measures you can't actually directly measure diaphragm function per se mm. so yeah there, yeah there are methods and opportunities and approaches you know being developed which may negate an isolated muscle model however actually doing that on a muscle specific level is currently quite difficult yeah yeah. My, my next point then, Cam, um, is, is one that I think we might have mentioned before, but it's, it's a little bit out there. The, the sense that we're obviously lacking a lot of um, longitudinal data yeah. in this area because I think one thing that I always try and have to get my head around, particularly as I've only been in this research for, what, a year or so, is that how can we be sure that we're looking at effects of obesity, certainly in vivo anyway, mm. how can we be sure that we're looking at effects of obesity and not sedentary behaviour? So... For example, I know we've chatted before about, you know, a number of different mechanisms that you can look at. We talked about neural, for example, which is obviously my background. It's well known, it's always well established that inactivity leads to impaired neuromuscular function, at, you know, right throughout the neural pathway. So how can we be sure or how can we be more confident obesity per se having an effect on some of these outcomes and not just sedentary behavior? Because it's a difficult one, isn't it, to disseminate between the two? And the so, effects of it too. So I guess, I guess that kind of relates to advantages of using an animal and an isolated muscle model. So granted, the most physiologically relevant species to use would be humans because we want to try and translate our findings from animals into humans, but by and large, the best would be to use humans. However, there are the caveats of assessing things like uh, muscle fatigue, for example. So as you know, um, you have central and peripheral fatigue. Peripheral fatigue could be down to um, the motor neurons fatiguing, or it could be down to chemical factors within the skeletal muscle causing fatigue. However, it would be difficult to actually control for fatigue in obese muscles because everybody has slightly different levels of fat mass around in their skeletal muscles. Actually, unless you do it neurally by uh, EMG analyses, it's quite difficult to actually perform that. And also then how can you understand how whether obesity affects skeletal muscle, does it affect neural propagation and neuromuscular junction and skeletal muscle activation? Yeah. So there's that, there's that factor. Also, because animals are fairly short-lived, they're in particular strain or particular type of mass that we use, they live up to two years by and large, uh, sometimes yeah. a bit less. But yeah, I'd say two years is a good span. What, what's advantageous about that approach of using an animal model is that you can capture multiple points of the animal lifespan. Granted, age and obesity work hasn't done that, but there is aging work which has used this multiple time span uh, sort of study. And then there's also other factors as well that you can control for activity levels. So you can place animals in the same cage. Granted, you can't make an animal move less and more, but because they've got the same space restrictions, you can't ex say one person has more space to move in than the other person. So um, you can account for sedentaryism. And there is also the opportunity to actually physically measure animal sedentaryism via video analysis. So you can actually place a camera above them and then trace their distance covered over a set time or you can do treadmill tests to look at exercise tolerance as well to see whether that's affected by age and obesity yeah. so there are those factors as well and i guess another key thing about an isolated muscle approach is that it removes neural innovation so you completely separate the muscle from the neuromuscular junction so you control it externally via a power supply to actually stimulate the split muscle to produce force or power mm. so th those are advantages of, of using an isolated muscle approach so you can understand the muscle specific nature independent of muscle control 
using animals of set of the same age with provide the same diet at a set amount of times so you have much greater control for actually understanding the how whether it is obesity affecting old age yeah. or is it um sedentaryism combined with obesity affecting old age so you've got you got we could talk about it all day couldn't we in in that sense and yeah definitely the positives and negatives i'm very much as you know an in vivo guy <laughs> but i certainly see the benefits i think one thing that'd be really nice it would never happen i don't think but would be a, a, to do a longitudinal in vivo study mm. where you've got activity matched obese and non-obese groups that would be an absolute dream but the, unless that, it's yeah, like a um a chat about that before right and you're PhD student in Coventry that's doing something similar. Yes, yeah, so there is a another PhD student on the supervision of Dr. Jason Tallis. His name is Josh Hurst. Yeah. And what for one of his studies, he's doing a really exciting study looking at prolonged chronic feeding on skeletal muscle contractile function. So how does because one of the limitations to my study published nutrients is that I provided a high fat diet um, at a later age. So that people were questioning is that really normal of human dietary habits of course it isn't but this this approach was used just, just to make sure we had a truly obese or a truly fat group and a truly yeah. less fat group yeah. compared, so we can understand whether it is obesity affecting those muscles in old age however what josh is doing is looking whether obesity during a prolonged period of time not obesity but mm high fat diet feeding through a long period of time a induces obesity and b whether that chronic aspect of it which is more normative than human humans affects muscle function so that's that, that's a really um exciting study yeah i think that's just important although you're talking about is it is it typical that you'd expect for humans in terms of how they become obese i'm not necessarily convinced that the cause of obesity the direct cause of obesity is that important in how no. you induce obesity but more the effects of it it is almost irrelevant i guess in some ways but i can understand the point i think it would also be really nice just to briefly mention and i know we've discussed this in the past the idea of this obese and sarcopenic obese and make it you know the definition and so on and so on but i think it's really important that obviously you're aware that we're, we're writing a, a few bits at the minute about this and in the area is that although obesity might be seen to act in some sense you know for argument's sake we'll just say in some sense that it can act as a, a potential protector of mortality although we'll talk about that in a, in a minute one thing for sure is that you, if you are correctly diagnosed as sarcopenic obese you're sort of in a vicious cycle there mm. um where there's no protection anymore because if you're sarcopenic you lose your muscle at an accelerated rate yes so i think that's when you've gone past a point you know not not of no return but of a, of a it's very different. difficult situation to get out of and a situation where I personally don't believe any you know obese at whatever level of obesity is offering any form of protection mm. and and I think it's really important as well. There's, there's been at least two reviews now in the last year that have come out, and I can't remember the first author names that have come out on the obesity paradox. And I think it's important that we briefly touch on that, yeah. being you know this idea that obesity in older age actually is linked to a reduced mortality, uh, mortality rates. It's important to note that those two review papers now, and I, I must try and find the, the first authors at some point, they've both shown the same thing, and that is that when you normalise that relationship to muscle mass, that relationship disappears. Mm. So it's really important to know that it's it doesn't seem to be some sort of odd effect of obesity, but the muscle mass is the really important yeah. thing. So yeah. even, the, even the underweight guys who have very low levels of fat are also at serious risk of early yeah. mortality and that is because seemingly they've got low levels of muscle mass and i think that's really important to always send that message home that although obesity on the surface level may offer some form of protection our focus should always be to better maintain muscle mass as we age and i think that's quite a simple message to get across i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that as well yeah definitely so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say obesity is protective at all. I, I'd I'd say obesity, irrespective, has a leads to poor prognosis and different other comorbidities beyond um, poor skeletal muscle function. However, I'm in agreement that there may be evidence to suggest that obesity doesn't necessarily cause greater mortality because you do have um, a greater source for metabolic demands, i.e. compared to someone who's undernourished who would be, I'd say, with greater risk yeah, yeah, of, yeah, of, of yeah. general or cause mortality. Yeah, so I agree in that sense. I think it's actually key to actually try and understand 
well, the whole point of the question, is obesity a risk factor for skeletal muscle aging? Not necessarily aging per se, but skeletal muscle aging in general. I think it's important to actually address the direct findings from the nutrient study that I published because to date that is the only study which has examined how obesity affects contractile function and could be a cause for skeletal muscle aging in, in rodents and at a muscle and muscle level. So this actual study, how we performed it is we uh, obtained female mice, so only a single sex, so there could be sex-based differences as well, mm -hmm. aged them to 70 weeks, which in humans is approximately 60 to 60 to 65 years of age, roughly. Yeah. Uh, there's no data which exists for this strain of mouse, CD1 uh, has a direct correlation with aging in humans. Anyway. We provided them with nine weeks of a high-fat diet, isolated Aceleus, which is a predominantly slow-twitch fiber type, found posturally, so isometric control, so quite standing, for example. The EDL, which is a fast-twitch, powerful skeletal muscle, which is important for explosive activities and uh, rapid acceleration of your body mass. Mm. And um, the diaphragm as well, which goes without saying, is an important regulator of our normal respiratory function. Yeah. And we provided a, a range of contractile tests. So historically, what a lot of obesity studies in rodents and isolate muscles have done have used something called isometric contractions, where they contract stimulate a muscle and it's held at a constant length to boost force. So you get a um, force. Uh, isometric force production and they generally show that there could be evidence for a decline in muscle quality particularly for the fast twitch EDL. Mm. Um, however this sort of approach is limited in the fact that apart from standing this this type of contraction isn't really found in vivo so there's relatively yeah. rare instances of, um, of isometric contraction so what we uniquely did is that we use something called the work loop technique, which essentially is providing muscles with sinusoidal wavelengths and allowing them to boost force during a shortening element of it. So you can actually calculate power, which has never been investigated before in isolated skeletal muscles that are old and obese. Interestingly, what we found is similar to in vivo studies, there's an increase in absolute force and absolute power output. So there could be evidence for increase in hypertrophy of these skeletal muscles. Mm -hmm. However, what's also interesting is that these muscles are also larger as well. So these obese muscles that are yeah. larger than the mean counterparts. So whether that's down to just a greater mass or greater ectopic accumulation of adipose tissue within the skeletal muscle, it's difficult to say mm. at stage because we haven't um, formed any histology. However, when actually normalizing to muscle cross-sectional area in terms of isometrics and to whole skeletal muscle mass, which is difficult to perform in in vivo, when normalizing work group power outputs to whole skeletal muscle mass, actually the quality of tissue remains unchanged. So the actual normalization process for locomotory muscles, yeah. there's no change in that ability. Another interesting finding that we found is when we actually use this work group model to induce fatigue, there's actually no difference in the ability for obese muscles to, in old age to withstand fatigue. Yeah. However, what we did find is that obesity in old animals and during our nine-week high-fat regimen was sufficient enough to induce a significant gain in adipose tissue. So one of our sort of outcomes is that even though the quality of the tissue remains unchanged and the fatigue resistance of locomotory skeletal muscles remain unchanged, they've still got to work against a greater bodily inertia. So in vivo activities may be yeah. inhibited. <laughs> and that means we wouldn't have known that without understanding how the quality of the tissue is unchanged. Yeah. What's also interesting is that we've measured the diaphragm. So the diaphragm respiratory function and still undergoes these signs or the wavelength changes in inhalation expiration. And the quality of that tissue actually is poorer in obesity. So as you were saying, as you enter into this negative cycle of obesity, so you get fatter, ability to move reduces, you get fatter, so on and so forth. One of the interesting potential aspects of, of that finding is that where the diaphragm has poor muscle quality is the ability for the uh, to actually perform in well. So one of the interesting aspects for that finding is the actual ability to intake oxygen into the body and actually metabolize fats at rest and during exercise. Mm. Because we actually maximally stimulate, stim, maximally stimulate the muscles, we are we have a better understanding how these muscles perform in vivo when they're actually working at their maximum exertion. So the actual quality of this tissue declines, and therefore overall respiratory function is likely to be poor in vivo. So actually getting oxygen into the body to metabolise fats 
could be poor and that could be a, a key mediator in the negative cycle of obesity in old obese populations yeah i've got um, a, a quick question for you actually cam on, on all your work and, and the work that josh is doing as well commentary is that and i think this is what's missing as well in or not as well but is missing in the in vivo work is that when you do these studies where you induce obesity in these mouse models do you match muscle composition and muscle size and then you know separate the two groups is is that what happens because one thing i'm it's a little bit out there to get your head around i appreciate it but one thing i'm curious to know is that with all this work that we seem to be doing in vivo where we take a snapshot let's say in later part of life where we've got distinction between the obese and the normal weight older individuals Mm -hmm. we see these distinct different characteristics you know whether it be muscle mass type 2 fiber against type 1 fiber composition or whatever yet what we don't know is you know 50 years ago or even 20 30 years ago were these obese people did they just have more muscle mass before they became obese anyway Mm -hmm. and is it just coincidence and i think that's what we can't be sure i mean it's a bit out there i know but I think that's what we can't be 100% sure of in vivo anyway. Mm. Uh, I'm sure you're probably going to bring me down now and say that it no, might no. not be absolutely certain in, in the animal models that you guys have done. But that's one thing I'm quite curious to know is, and is it that, and I, again, this is a bit out there, but could it be that these guys, if they do seem to have bigger muscle mass, if we look at a long, you know, a longitudinal study, they seem to have bigger muscle mass, then could it be that generally speaking, obviously it's very individually specific, that people with muscle mass, who have a higher metabolic rate, of course, are they potentially more vulnerable to becoming obese in older age? And again, it's a little bit out there to say that. I appreciate that with no evidence whatsoever. But it's one thing that I've just thought about in the sense that without longitudinal evidence, we can't really be confident to say. But I'm just curious to know of your thoughts really in your animal models in relation to just going back to the ignore all of that blurb. But going back to the original question in, in your studies, do you have the same or do you match for muscle fiber type composition and muscle size yeah. and then separate them into groups? Well, there, there won't be any value in my opinion of matching for fiber composition because they're going to slightly vary anyway that's why we do a muscle specific examination of muscles of a particular phenotype so the psoas is predominantly type 1 uh, fiber type which is slow which is very slow but very fatigue resistant the udl has greater composition of type 2a type 2x and type 2b yeah. um, muscle fibers compared to type 1 fibers and it's less so we get we, we can still capture muscle specific differences and phenotypic differences and then the diaphragm not only is it a completely different in vivo mechanical role that's a more of a mixed fiber type so we can get somewhere a bit middle grounds at this current stage it's, it's difficult to say what you're trying to say oh do these myth- different muscles of different phenotypes respond differently we know they do respond differently so we know the slayers and EDL don't respond as much as the diaphragm so there are there's there's um anatomical roles and there's um phenotypic roles as well yeah. so one, one of our sort of hypotheses for poor diaphragm quality is the fact that you've got gravity you know, you've got um, adipose tissue loading on the thoracic cavity and actually forcing the muscle to kind of like stretch almost yeah, um, yeah. so it's working disproportionately to its length tension relationship and actually yeah. this added strain on the muscle could increase um, a non-contractile element such as collagen which is the stretching yeah. muscle in our passive forces um, well, actually one of the interesting things from our work group actually when we physically draw them we see a greater extension phase so this eccentric phase accounts for greater negative work so overall you're getting more or you're getting a great amount of negative work smaller network and therefore less power output there is another interesting avenue that we are currently exploring at the moment and and that is normalizing muscle function to lean tissue mass yeah and so you could do that in a using muscle cross natural area from ct scans where you just take what is muscle what is fat subtract one another and do it that way but you only capture a part of that of that muscle where it could be completely different architecture and completely different composition at a different part of the ct scan so one advantage of that we can actually extract lipids from the skeletal muscle and normalize it to um, lean tissue mass to, to see whether it, the quality of the contractile component of the muscle is poorer. We haven't actually got findings on it, that's something we're currently working on, but it could be a really exciting finding if we could show yeah. that at the whole muscle level, granted there's no change, and maybe there's no change even in the composition of fibers or the size of the fibers, which is something yeah. we're working on with um, Hans the Gen at Manchester Met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of morphological aspects of obesity in young and old rodents, even if there's no morphological change at the contractile level is this poor so the even the ability for acting and myosin to interact with one another is that affected by and old age 
and whether we then by performing that sort of analysis that could be an indicator to say if there are if there is poor quality then yes there could be something actually happening in the ability for the um, cost cycle to actually occur yeah I think it's, it's really good points, and I really like the, the point that you mentioned on um, on the diaphragm as well. But I should also say, for the record, that, and I think you're fully aware of this anyway, but I, I certainly don't believe that obesity has a protective effect. And I really like the fact that those two papers came out recently because I think up until then there was quite a bit of support, and I still think there is a bit of support in certain groups. They're confident that obesity does have some form of protection, and I think you know, on a basic fundamental level, when I look at, back all through my education to to start advocating a level even if it is a degree of obesity for me is just the wrong thing but one, one thing i'd really like to discuss really briefly soon as we got the chance is the treatment of sarcopenic obesity and not really i know this is in vivo stuff i think it's really important just to briefly touch on because i know a few guys have done some really nice work on it and i know david scott over in australia Sorry, that's it, yeah. i can't remember where he's where he's based at the minute david but he's he's a really nice guy and i've chatted to him a little bit on twitter as well and um he's just published a paper that's still in press really and i read for a bit of it the other day and it essentially shows that you know in aging when we lose muscle mass a given amount of muscle mass i think it's five percent that you've done in the paper mm. that you see significant impairments in muscle function yeah but when you control for loss of muscle i mean this might seem obvious to, to well, many people by resistance training and dietary intervention when you when you say control for loss of muscle do you mean via some sort of exercise intervention so yeah what, yeah so the, their intervention i can't remember their specific intervention but basically their two interventions what they used was uh, one where they promoted body fat loss five percent body fat loss and one where they promoted a five percent weight loss but with muscle mass loss as well so they controlled for any muscle mass lost in the other group if that makes sense i yeah. can't remember the specifics of it but ultimately the basic message to send home is that when you in aging when you lose five percent of uh, mass mass seems to be predominantly fat whereas if you lose five percent which is predominantly lean tissue you see significant impairments in muscle function but you don't see significant impairments in muscle function when you lose body fat. And yeah. I know that might seem blindingly obvious, the, the listener, but I think it's a really important message to send home. And it's something that actually okay. hasn't, I'm not sure there's too many papers out there that have replicated something like that from his group, but it's a really important message to send across that, particularly in sarcopenic, sarcopenic obese individuals, these are elderly individuals who are obese, they're carrying lots of fat. They might look relatively healthy in, in a strange way because they're, they're, not, they're not massive because they haven't got much much muscle mass um, but they are carrying significant amounts of fat and it's important to recognize that when we get these guys to lose weight that we're focusing on losing fat and not putting them through programs where they're losing both fat and lean tissue or pre probably predominantly lean tissue if it's some sort of harsh regime and i'm not going to go into the ins and outs of different diets but there's a lot of fad diets out there that are used across a whole different range of groups and and ages and i think it's really important that to remember on a very uh, sorry lay basic level you know these guys have become obese over a long long period of time it doesn't take a magician or or a, a rocket scientist to recognize that the way they should then lose fat is over a long long time and it might seem wrong um, because they probably haven't got much time on their side but it would be safer for them to gradually lose fat even at an, an older age rather than significantly cut you know calories and so on and lose significant amounts of body fat at the consequence of losing significant amounts of lean tissue as well and i know that's more of an in vivo approach but it's something that i'm really interested in in is the optimal and we certainly don't know at the minute what the optimal treatment of sarcopenic obesity is and i know that's sort of going in and out of a couple of bits that we talked about but i think it's a really important point just to briefly mention based on your current work how are you hoping to plug the current gaps in knowledge about sarcopenic obesity in relation to muscle mass and muscle function it's a good question and um, I think for our work we, we're just trying to get as sounds silly but get as much information of, of what's going on what we're not doing is we're not actually looking at sarcopenic obese individuals so that makes it a little bit tricky but we will have an, an obese older group and a, and a normal weight older group as well and comparing that to a younger group a younger normal weight group hmm. but, I think the interesting ways forward as you quite rightly say is understanding whether um, obesity is reversible essentially and mm. any negative effects on skeletal muscle function whether that is reversible via exercise or calorie restriction 
So there's a uh, there's an interesting paper which has um, looked at this um, sort of relationship, granted in in young animals, but and it was in zebrafish. So they a zebrafish is a good model because there are there's no gravity associated effects on uh, muscle function because they're suspended in water, so okay, they, they, that, that doesn't affect too. that doesn't yeah, affect them. The there's a cool study which looks at how obesity in in fish affects muscle function and whether that's reversible via poor swimming and interestingly it, granted that was in in young fish it's been shown that, that muscle function what? can't recuperate to the same levels oh, as yeah. as prior to any sort oh, of in uh yeah. obesity and what's cool about this ever fish model is that yeah. because they're suspended in water there's no gravity effects there's no loading effects yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, quite interesting. Yeah. However, yeah. With, with the effects of um, with gravity, could that essentially promote a favourable change in, in muscle function? So, in animals, for example, could after getting animals old and obese, could something such as calorie restriction, which has been really extensively examined as a as a really key uh, really key strategy for prolonging lifespan can that also have a favorable effect on some muscle function and also other factors such as uh, exercise how can can that have a favorable shift in animal morphology and muscle morphology and actually reverse those obesity mediated changes and promote an improvement in contractile function which have yet to be fully explored but if we can show that that then we can show granted it's been shown in humans but can we show it in a muscle specific manner yeah and um, just to touch on your question, because I didn't really answer it, I guess we bypassed it, but we could probably talk a good few hours, and we probably will do in uh, another time, mm-hmm. about the kind of data that we're collecting at the moment. And I think really we're just in the early stages of some of the work that we're doing, and, and hopefully it will lead on. The reason I mentioned treatment is is because hopefully it will lead on to some sort of treatment intervention type based research that we'll be looking for some grant funding for. Just to give you know the listeners some sort of perspective is is we're obviously taking we're taking muscle tissue from these guys, um, which is going to be our predominant analysis method, if you like if you like, of uh, investigating some of these mechanisms that we're looking at in terms of the effects of obesity and aging. We already mentioned the idea of this muscle-specific force and um, using the patella tendon moment arm and, and so on to, to look at the differences in force production and some sort of some of the neuromuscular characteristics as well. Our main sort of principle behind this study is that in the obese individuals, during an exercise task, as you mentioned with gravity and, and high amounts of muscle mass, that following the exercise task, we see elevated levels of muscle protein protein synthesis mm. and we we're originally going to be using an IV isotope but we can't we're not using that anymore for, for ethical reasons that are beyond our control but we're using deuterated water in order to uh, further tease out some of the some of the mechanisms and and understand the differences in muscle protein synthesis between these groups are you doing mass spectrometry yes yeah oh, that's awesome yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be using mass spec and a number of other bits that I'll briefly mention in a moment. But so we're going to be using uh, using those kind of techniques to, to say to better understand the muscle protein synthetic responses following a bout of weight bearing exercise. Uh, you mentioned EMG briefly earlier. We're going to be using, or I say we're going to, we're doing this as we as we speak. Um, we're using uh, the EMG shorts that you might have seen that are produced by MyonTech. Uh, very different to the to the EMG electrodes that I've used in the past, which are much more sophisticated. But there's a it's a really nice sort of novel technique that we're still getting some reasonable signals from so we'll get an idea of, of a muscle activity or a, an indirect measure of muscle activity and we're going to be using we're going to be doing a load of, or a number of things really with the muscle tissue to better understand some of the mechanisms uh, again between these groups so i mentioned microscopy earlier we're, get, we're collaborating with uh, dr joachim nielsen over at um, southern denmark um, who you, you might be aware of who's sort of yeah. an expert i guess in the area of microscopy and uh, we're looking to see or are we going to basically gain a lot of information on lipid droplets so the volume and quantity and so on of lipid droplets in the tissue how close are the lipid droplets to the mitochondria at rest how close are they to the mitochondria after exercise two days after or one day after exercise two days after exercise and so on so we've got a lot of scope to take in in a number of different ways we're also collaborating with with sam shepherd who you you might know as well over at ljmu at liverpool john moores and we're going to be looking at the plim protein group and he's done some really nice work we haven't really got enough time to talk 
about the individual plim proteins and i'm by no means an expert which is why we're collaborating with sam but hopefully we'll get some really nice information on that so some of some of the tri- intramuscular triglyceride work that he's done and we'll be looking to you know combine that with the microscopy work with Joachim and potentially even look at um, some lipidomics work as well um, we're collaborating with Jan, uh, Jan Boren over at Sweden at the University of Gothenburg so hopefully we're going to inc- be incorporating some of the some of his lipidomics work as well which would be really nice but hopefully what you can see and this is this is just a, a, well, it's the predominant amount of uh, analyses that we're doing but we're doing some others, other bits around it but hopefully the, the listeners can gain an understanding of a basic understanding of the kind of information we're going to be getting hopefully to advance our understanding of the effects of obesity and age in, in vivo and then hope depending on what we find then hopefully it will lead on to some exciting treatment based base work hopefully but that's basically where we we sit at the moment and uh i guess with with all this research the most difficult thing is recruitment and recruiting the older obese guys is particularly tricky in fact to date although we, we only started data collection about three months ago we haven't actually recruited any older obese guys at the minute so it's something that we're we're working on and we, we've got some time on our side fortunately to see if we can push some of these guys through but yeah hopefully that gives a gives a picture of the of you know what we're doing i guess to provide provide a picture of my current and future research aspects in relation to this topic of oh, this start again i guess to contextualize the uh, the future research aspects for my research group we currently x-ray skeletal muscles using um synchrotron based facilities uh, which are high powered x-rays allow, which allows us to look at the um, structural level of skeletal muscle during the muscle activation yeah so yeah it's yeah. muscle between the beam fire an x-ray at it whilst it's contracting we can look at the the actin myosin interactions in skeletal muscle yeah. and look at how factors such as myosin attachment myosin dissociation effects activation relaxation dynamics prior to the to recent calcium for example mm-hmm. so basically we're looking essentially at the regulation of the thick filament of skeletal muscle and how that affects muscle activation muscle relaxation yeah. what's cool about that is should our work examining the normalization of muscle contractile function to lean tissue mass to show that the quality is poorer and that may suggest that there is reason to believe that axin myosin um, associations are affected in older obese muscles at that level. Because we have shown there's an increase in muscle mass in older obese individuals, increase in absolute mass, but the quality of the overall tissue at the whole muscle mass remains unchanged. Should there be those changes at the uh, at the lean tissue level, then there's reason to believe there's changes at the actin myosin level. So yeah. therefore, we can actually re- replicate the study that we did in nutrients in- instead, rather than the kind of whole muscle, we just use this X-ray diffraction technique and actually physically look at how the muscles interact with one another in the um, generation of force. So it understands how the uh, the structure of the muscle is altered by obesity in old age. Therefore, what could be cool is prior to, well, should, should say, for example, someone not have the capacity to do exercise or are so severely energy limited that they are unable to perform exercise or they have other complications which removes the ability for factors such as gastric bypass surgery, for example, which actually control their weight and actually reduce their weight to the actual perform exercise exercise and therefore improve the muscle function. Should those factors be unavailable, then pharmacotherapies and senolytics can then be incorporated to actually target the muscle either during calcium mediated activation of the muscle or even prior to that as well to actually facilitate the um, the binding of myosin to actin to actually improve force and therefore overall contractile performance. So that that would be much further down the line. We need to actually further understand how these interactions occur more specifically. But if we can understand that, we can then apply other models to it and actually understand truly how muscles may affect uh, how obesity may affect skeletal muscles in old age. Yes. I guess, it, I guess it kind of comes back full circle. Is obesity a risk factor for skeletal muscle aging? It depends on the muscle you examine. It depends yeah. on the type of muscle contraction that you use. It depends on your population. And I guess, I guess it depends on, on a multitude of factors. But by and large, I think one of the most interesting findings is, irrespective of the muscle you examine, the overall in vivo mechanical complications are far poorer so activities of daily living are poorer and therefore quality of life is poorer and I think no matter what sort of approach you take 
the, the overall the overall motivation should be for improving quality of life yeah and i think ultimately as well just just to finish off i guess it sounds like it feels like we're finishing off here but yeah, I'll it, around, around a bit. you know yeah i think ultimately and it seems a basic message to get across but with no load you know there's there's only negative effects of obesity i mean it's predominantly negative anyway but oh and this is this goes back to the start the first question i guess when we initially started talking on or briefly chatting on on twitter is that ultimately irrespective of the muscle you look at we could talk about weight bearing muscles and so on with no weight to bear i.e if there's no load no activity obesity can only offer negative effects on skeletal muscle function i I think i think a perfect prime example of that sort of population would be bed rested individuals so anybody that has been in a hospital for a prolonged period of time not only does that disuse atrophy accelerate muscle uh muscle loss or muscle atrophy the actual um, implications of obesity particularly in older populations as well the uh could actually seriously accelerate the uh, loss of muscle mass even further and therefore make recovery from such periods of prolonged bed rest really difficult so yeah i completely agree on that one yeah no i completely agree as well with your comments i think perhaps the final thing to say is that if this is left in is that um you know if anyone did want to contact me then then hopefully ryan will, will leave our contact details somewhere on the page for people to contact and you know always looking for people to recruit you're always looking for mice to recruit of course but um <laughs> uh, yeah no it's, it's great it's great to chat so. yeah yeah no i thought enjoy it yes it's been yeah not a nice little discussion hopefully as i say hopefully the viewers found it interesting and stimulating and hopefully they may have some potentially counter arguments to our suggestions as well to actually yeah, try and bring more well-rounded understanding of the topic yeah and again i think um you know if anyone listens to this and, or watches it and thinks that me or you certainly from, from my perspective have, s- have said something that they disagree with then i'd la- love to chat that to them because obviously uh the more i'm wrong the more i learn so um <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's not so we can all live by. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so um and I'm, I'm sure i was probably wrong or someone disagreed with something that i said to say so uh yeah that no, was great